And welcome one and welcome all to the Rating Stream. It is Monday, it's Tuesday, it is time for us to venture forth. <laughs> 20,000 leagues across the sea, or under the sea, or above the sea, or through the sea, or whatever it is that we're doing. But welcome one, and welcome all to the writing stream, where we're dissecting, slowly and surely, Jules Verne's classic 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, well, I am, and, and you guys are providing the, the amusement and stuff. <laughs> Um, as we go along. So it's a very relaxed, very chilled out way of, um, of, of exploring classic um, science fiction content. That's kind of what we're about. Um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But before we get into any of that, we must do the thing because the thing is the thing. The thing must be done. <sighs> right. <laughs> let me let me scroll up to the top of the chat. Right. Have a boo boo's here. Ah, see back in number one spot there. Have a boo boo. It's always good to see you where you're supposed to be. Uh, right at the top of the stream. Come on, the tragic blue twenty one is here as well. The hard coders are here, fresh as ever, ready to read the rackets. Uh, Sean fifty nine North TV is here as well. Well done, Sean fifty nine North TV. Commander C Twiller is here, um, having survived my earlier puns. <laughs> Uh, I did enjoy that one this morning. I, thought, I remember thinking to myself, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. Uh, <laughs> and the Rackets is here, fighting off the invasion of the Hulk. It's good to see you, Rackets. Always good to see you both on the stream. Uh, Commander JR 1988 is here. And Winterview GB is here. Of course, of course he is. Because he always is. It's just, just is. Uh, Man Monks of this here, poised as ever, with his Wikipedia open and ready to go, just in case we need it. Alan is here as well. Alan RP42, always good to see you, sir. Uh, <laughs> Bion Toxin is here as well. Um, and anyways, seems to be Drew's favourite word in this video. Why? I, I suppose, anyway. <laughs> I mean, anyway. <laughs> What can I say to that? Luckily, Luigi is here as well. Uh, Big Thirty Nine GT is here as well. So welcome, welcome one, and welcome all to. Um, is that an MG hat badge? It is. Look, actually, no. Is it an MG? No, I think it might be a Triumph TR Six. I can't remember. Um, I think my son gave it to me. It's probably a Triumph TR Six. I've got a feeling it's a Triumph TR Six. I think my son gave it to me some years ago. So I don't know why I've decided. Uh, to put a Triumph TR6 badge on my hat tonight, but it, I picked it up and thought, well, that, that one hasn't uh, that one hasn't been out for a while. Let's, let's wear that. The thing is, it's also a green Triumph TR6 badge, which of course makes it look like I've got a small hole in my head, which is Triumph TR6 sized, which is quite impressive. Uh, <laughs> is it a Spitfire? I, I don't know. Can you see it close? I can't, I can't if I can get that close. I think, I think it's a TR6. I'm pretty sure it's a TR6. Uh, I don't think it's a Spitfire, no. Um, well, that's got wings, isn't it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no comment. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I don't know a great deal about classic cars of that age vintage. Um, flat grills. <laughs> Someone's going to talk about the refined funnel engines of the TR6 as opposed to the Spitfire because it's a very interesting deployment of the twin fairing beam arms. <laughs> And the lower track control rods. Very interesting, you know. <laughs> We're not doing that. <laughs> of course, if you have the later outrigger versions or the Model B Type 6. <laughs> uh, you can always tell the Type Bs because there's a rattlesnake in the airbox. <laughs> uh, I've been to a few car meets like that. <laughs> Waffle says went to be TV. Yeah, I know. Apologies. 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 We will get round to it. We will. Because that's we, we do get there eventually. Um, but there we go. Never mind. <laughs> Does it have a dethrottle now? Stop it. Behave yourself. <laughs> Nobody mentioned Lloyd's. <laughs> I got quite excited about that the other week, didn't I? Um, um, <laughs> well, there's this thing about Lloyd's, you should know. <laughs> Oh, we're not going to go that way, though. Uh, there'll be something. There'll be there'll be something. Something in the next. So, uh, to be honest, there's quite a lot of talk about electricity in the upcoming sections, which I will have. I will have an opinion on. I had to tell somebody off on um, on the internet today. They got something wrong. Can you believe that? <laughs> I went to this YouTube video, which is actually quite good. It was talking about friction and and car turning circles and various parts and pieces. But they they made the fatal mistake. Of, of talking about centrifugal force and I mean you know <laughs> a man has to do what a man has to do so I was in there straight away saying ah centrifugal force doesn't exist 
there's no such thing. So they're fortunately, I mean, they haven't responded yet, but I'm, I'm sure they'll be extremely grateful, okay, that I've corrected their bad understanding of physics. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we shall see what happens. Uh, I wonder if Lloyd's would ensure a part of the deconstructed Triumph Spitfire. Uh, did, I, did, I, did I used to work at Lloyd's of London? Oddly enough, <laughs> I did. I used to give people tours of Lloyd's of London, uh, which was actually a lot of fun. It was actually a lot of fun. Because um, we have this fascinating collection. No, sorry. <laughs> but we did. And we did have a fascinating collection of stuff, uh, which I could wax lyrical about for probably the entire stream. But we won't do that. We won't do that. This is not the Lloyd's of London official... Twitch channel. I don't think they have an official Twitch channel. I'd be very surprised if they did. In fact, I don't even know if they know what the internet is yet. But <laughs> um, <laughs> it isn't, isn't it? Centripetal force. It is indeed. Centripetal force does exist. Uh, but most people are talking about inertia when they think they're talking about centrifugal force. But there we go. Uh, <laughs> get on with it, says Winterview GB. <laughs> like I'm in the Muppet Show tonight. Winterview GB and Commander Sea Dweller. Like. <laughs> Waldorf and Statler, they're sitting in the top corner of the chat, heckling me. <laughs> What's he talking about again? Ah, <laughs> oh dear, right. Anyway, <laughs> it's our job. <laughs> uh, right, anyway, right. <laughs> what are we doing? You started it last night, I did. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Uh, right, uh, let's uh, well, switch to here. Right, Here's it, here at least is is the text that we're supposed to be talking about. So let's let's get on with it. <laughs> Every force has an equal and opposite force, unless it's a waffle. <laughs> that stream was not bad. Oh, it was all bad. <laughs> you guys are good. <laughs> you should audition for this. I think it'd be excellent. Um, right. Anyway, we left our. <laughs> We left our intrepid here. No, I am the unstoppable horse. Um, yes, yeah, the, the power of the power of the ball. Uh, <laughs> I will be the number one streamer of Lloyd's of London. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've already got that accolade, uh, but never mind. Right, um, <laughs> right. So uh, we left our intrepid explorers last week. They were they were stuck on top of the north. Well, they didn't know it's the Nautilus yet. The, uh, what do they call it? The Strange Mechanical Boat, I think they were calling about it. And um, basically they were on top of it. And then the boat was about, it started moving off, hadn't it? It has been moving off for a while. And then it started to sink. So they sort of pounded on the top and then a hatch opened and they all got wrestled inside. So that's that was the dam da da at the end of the last stream. Um, so, on to the next chapter. <laughs> now, um, this is, <laughs> as you can see, is chapter eight. Um, and this has a nice bit of Latin, okay? A nice bit of Latin. <laughs> still, everybody is still doing Wattler. <laughs> All Dolphin Statler. Uh, it would be ugly, but a busy flying a spaceship. Um, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an inscrutable object? <laughs> unstoppable, we'll see about that, said Jimmy Jimmy. Ah, right, come on, the fight. <laughs> We're supposed to be doing 20,000 things on the sea. Behave yourself at the back of the class. Right. Mobilis in mobili, a nice piece of Latin. Now, I like a little bit of Latin, as you probably know. Um, and um, I would translate that as um, motion in movement. I think that's what it means. Um, now, I, um, I remember this so distinctly that I named, for those of you who probably remember, um, um, I named the ship in... Um, the Shadewood Saga, the Mobilis, because obviously I couldn't call it the Nautilus because that would just be plagiarism. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. So if uh, any of, any people on the stream watching, actually, I want to be a serious writer. Plagiarism bad. OK, don't do that. Don't copy other people's work. But you can kind of make little nods to other other things. That's OK. That's 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 cool. You're allowed to do that. So um, I remember this chapter from years and years and years ago when I read this story, thinking, well, it's it's an electrical ship, right? And the Nautilus, as we'll find out, is an electrical submarine. Um, and I remember this chapter, Mobilis in Mobile. And I thought, Mobilis, well, that's quite a good name for a ship, isn't it? Let's call it. Um, so I did pinch this. So the Mobilis in the Shadewood series, if you've ever read any of my stories, is specifically named um, after this. It's a little homage to Jules Verne 
um, who has been called the father of science fiction. Uh, whether he can be called the father of science fiction, I'm not sure, because um, we have decided on the stream that Mary Shelley is the uh, is she the mother of science fiction? I don't know, or the grandmother. I don't know how it works, but um, um, it, it, we we kind of kind of agreed that science fiction started with Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, uh, and Jules Verne came along a little bit later. And Jules Verne, bless him, did kind of try and big up Mary Shelley as a kind of you know I was inspired by her writing, so which is which is a cool thing that he did. Um, no, he didn't. Says so Commander C to a <laughs> Still heckling from the back. <laughs> Jules Verne seems to be the weird uncle of science fiction. <laughs> Does that make me my cousin's brother's uncle's former roommate of science fiction? <laughs> Asimov is right, is Verne, says Frank Meyer. So there's, as you can see, there's still a bit of debate. <laughs> um, anyway, so Mobilis in Mobileye, this is, this is a chapter. Now what happens here is, um, basically our, our heroes get bundled down inside um um you know the 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 the, the um, metal machine because that, that's all they have for it at the moment um uh, they don't know who they're dealing with um um interesting enough here's a little you know the thing i was complaining about last week uh is that you know there was no yeah, um professor aronek seems entirely <laughs> relaxed in the previous chapter about the fact that he's been exposed to the sea in the middle of the Pacific Ocean for goodness knows how many hours. But at least now we get a little bit of you know acknowledgement of that. You know, he's shivering all over. So he's a little bit he's a little bit chilly at this point. So at least there was a slight acknowledgement to the physical condition these poor guys would be having been exposed on the top of a boat for goodness knows how long, um, being splashed by the sea. Um, um, so they they get kind of bundled down, they get chucked um the narrow hatch closes over and they're surrounded by a profound so they can't see where they're going okay they um um they get pushed um around and at the foot of the ladder a door opened and instantly closed behind us with a loud clang okay so they're sort of just chucked in a cell um um where were they uh, all was darkness but such after darkness after several minutes my eyes were still unable to catch a single of those hazy gleams that drift through even the blackest night so they basically locked in a room with no lights at all um um so uh <laughs> here's a little bit of 19th century swearing which is always always good for a laugh meanwhile furious things going on ned land gave free reign to his indignation <laughs> damnation he exclaimed <laughs> again i'm sure this is not the language that 19th century sailors used <laughs> these people are about as hospitable as the savages of new caledonia wherever that is, or was. Uh, all that's lucky is them to be cannibals. I wouldn't be surprised if they were, but believe you me, they won't eat me without kicking up a protest. <laughs> Golly gosh, exactly. Um, <laughs> Conse attempts to calm him down. Calm yourself, Ned, my friend. Don't flare up so quickly. We aren't in a kettle yet. <laughs> um... I like this this bit, next bit made me chuckle again for the <laughs> apologies for the Americans on the stream. Uh, Jules Verne, or at least I'm not sure if it is Jules Verne, or perhaps it's just the translator, <laughs> does seem to have a little bit of a sniffy attitude towards Americans. So apologies for this; it's not intentional, but it is quite funny. Uh, luckily, my Bowie knife, the Canadian shot back, hasn't left me, and I can still see well enough to put it to use. Uh, which, which doesn't really match the, the previous paragraph where everything is utterly pitch black. Uh, the first of these bandits who lays a hand on me. And then we have a little star. Author's note. A Bowie knife is a wide-bladed dagger that Americans are forever carrying around. <laughs> um... <laughs> Yes, he turned the air blue with his terrible swearing. My goodness, what a bother. Uh, <laughs> it's, an, it's a bear explaining. <laughs> American blitz explaining. Uh, so that, that, did, <laughs> that did make me chuckle. Um, right, and in, 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 in a piece of uh, advice that always works, doesn't it? Um, don't be so irritable. <laughs> I get the feeling Professor Aronnax has never been married, because <laughs> it works, doesn't it? I mean, when, when you when you and your wife, or yeah, or uh, if you're a wife, you're having an argument with your husband. Um, 
saying to the opposite person, now just calm down. <laughs> Always works a treat. <laughs> top, <laughs> top relationship uh, counselling advice there from me. Uh, okay, so the author's note is not in the French version. Okay, so the author has just dropped that in at that point for, for our convenience. So now we know that all Americans are <laughs> carry Bowie knives around with them, okay? How's your, by the way, Glenn, how is your, how is your Bowie knife? Is, is it, is it still sharp? Is it, do you have it to hand right now? <laughs> Married is equivalent to being kidnapped by a submarine in the Atlantic. No, it's the Pacific. It's very important to get the details right, Commander Sea Dweller. <laughs> Glenn's not sure where his Bowie knife is. Uh, <laughs> it's a David Bowie knife. Well... <laughs> Sorry there, Joe. I need to. Just an absolute beginner with that kind of quote. You can't do that. Uh, Glenn's dropped his Bowie knife. Um, to be specific, it's the Pacific. <laughs> I'm not doing that again because that's just hard work. Um, right. Anyway, so they're 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 a bit irritable, as you can kind of understand. Um, I started moving, groping my way, and after five steps, I found an iron wall made of riveted boilerplate. I turned around and bumped into a wooden table next to which several stools had been set. Uh, the floor of this prison lay hidden beneath thick hempen matting that deadened the sound of footsteps. <laughs> it's a pretty good description for the fact it's totally pitch black. Uh, um, anyway, so, um, and it's tall enough, not, not even lead man can, 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 can reach the ceiling. So, uh, <clears throat> so, um, so half an hour goes by. Um, use my Bowie knife to butter my toast this morning, you know. Excellent. I'm well, I'm glad that you've got your Bowie knife, Glenn. I, next time I go to America, and I'll ask everybody, that's probably a bad idea, isn't it? Have you got a Bowie knife? <laughs> when suddenly the lights get switched on, the prison lit up all, all at once. In other words, it was filled with luminescent matter so intense that at first I couldn't stand the brightness of it, and from its glare and whiteness, I recognised the electric glow that had played around this underwater boat like some magnificent phosphorescent phenomenon. Uh, after voluntarily closing my eyes, I reopened them and saw the luminous force came from a frosted half globe curving out of the cabin ceiling. Um, <laughs> good old, good old Conseil here. He's like, master must learn patience. Just calm down, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm not. It's a, it's a curious one, isn't it? Our prison lit up all at once. In other words, it was filled with luminescent matter. <laughs> I don't think that's quite what he meant, um, Jules Verne, somehow. But anyway, um, so the cabin contains a table and five stalls. The invisible door must have been hermetically sealed, because not a sound reached our ears. Everything seemed dead in this boat. Was it motionary or stationary? Um, couldn't tell. Um, anyway, so then some people appear. One was short and stocky, powerfully muscled, broad shoulder, robust of limbs, the head squat, the hair black and luxuriant. A very, <laughs> very, very detailed description of this guy. His whole personality is stamped with that southern blooded zest that in France typifies the people of Provence. The philosopher Diderot has aptly claimed a man's bearing as a clue to his character, and this stocky little man was certainly living proof of this claim. Um, um, anyway, so that's, that's, that's that guy. Uh, then we meet somebody else. The second stranger deserves a more detailed description, so not just a single paragraph, more than one paragraph. A disciple of such character judging anomalies and stuff. I mean, it goes on for a while, this. Um, um, since his head reared like a nobleman's above the arc formed by the lines of his shoulders and his black eyes gaze with icy assurance and calmness. Now, does anybody actually have black eyes? Is that a thing? Um, I mean, you can have quite dark I mean I've got dark brown eyes I don't know if you can see them look there you go dark brown eyes right and people have green eyes and blue eyes and grey eyes I've seen I've never seen it. It, does he actually have black eyes <laughs> maybe he was in a fight <laughs> oh yeah I've got black eyes I don't think it means I'm pretty sure I'm assuming it means the irises are black but I don't think I've ever seen anybody with black irises um, maybe they just look black yeah but no, no, the entire room is full with luminescent phosphorescence, uh, Commander Sea Dwellers. <laughs> Surely enough to see the colour of his eyes. <laughs> you have black eyes when I beat you with my boat knife. <laughs> ah, dear. Right, so um, icy assurance. Oh, calmness since the skin. Pale rather than ruddy indicate tranquility of blood. What does that mean? Tranquility of blood. Energy shown by the swiftly knitting muscles of his brow and finally courage since his deep breathing denoted tremendous reserves of vitality. So... <laughs> 
Here's a tip, okay? If you walk into a room and uh, you want to you want to impress people, right? Um, rear your head like a nobleman, right? Um, skin pale, okay? Tranquility of blood, there we are. Um, energy shown by the swiftly knitting muscles of his brow. And finally, courage, since it's deep breathing. <sighs> Okay, see, so look, there you are. I am the absolute epitome of this chap. Uh, <laughs> um, there are <laughs> Mad Monks of has Mad Monks of has been to Wikipedia for us. There are sixteen different genes that are responsible for the colour of our eyes. Okay, these genes fine tune our eye colour, though the amount of melanin present in our irises. The resulting colours of melanin in our eyes can range from a wide variety of hues like blue and grey, but the darkest possible colour is very dark brown and not black. So Bit of scientific inaccuracy from Jules Verne, then. Ha <laughs> ha! Excellent. <laughs> My God, says Frank Meyer, it's Captain Nemo. Um, I might add that this was a man of great pride. His calm, firm gaze seemed to reflect thinking on the elevated plane. Um, I felt involuntarily reassured. Um, and this boded well. So this is a little bit, this is a quite a curious. I quite like it. It makes it quite old fashioned, but it's, um, it's quite, um, quite an interesting description basically we're being we are being told so this is a bit of show don't tell or tell don't show effectively the other way around which is kind of frowned upon nowadays but it kind of works here um so you were kind of getting that he's a proud um confident he's strong he's a bit of a thinker and all that kind of stuff so um whether this individual was 50, 35 or 50 years of age i couldn't precisely say now this is interesting <laughs> Of course, for those of us on the stream who are advancing in years, like Captain Nemo, in my head, is like <laughs> quite this old guy, right? Uh, <laughs> Captain Nemo, based on that, is, is considerably younger, probably, than I am now. So I am I'm older than Captain Nemo. Uh, that's a bit scary. Um, he was tall, his forehead broad, his nose straight, his mouth clearly etched, his teeth magnificent. His hands refined, tapered, and to use a word from palmistry, highly psychic. In other words, worthy of serving a lofty and passionate spirit. The man was certainly the most wonderful physical specimen I had ever encountered. <laughs> that's not something that's very common to say about another man, is it? Uh, <laughs> one unusual details. His eyes were spaced a little far from each other, and I could instantly take in nearly a quarter of the horizon. That, that's a weird thing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> his eyes were slightly further apart. Uh, <laughs> than one would expect um so he's a, like a sort of fish-like thing going on there maybe um he had strengthened by range of vision even greater than ned lands wow well, there we are um my manx of says i do feel however that i haven't aged at least in the face in the last year well that's that's something i i have i think um um Anyway, quite a lot of stuff. Anyway, so they're wearing caps of seal to fur and seal skin, fishing boots and etc, etc, etc. Anyway, so basically these guys talk with a language that nobody <laughs> looks like Sid from <laughs> Yeah, They talk in a language he does that Professor Aranax, that great linguist of our time, doesn't recognise. Um, sonorous, harmonious, flexible dialect whose vowels seem to undergo a highly buried accentuation. Welsh, perhaps. <laughs> um, the other replied with a shake of the head and added two or three utterly incomprehensible words. He seemed to question me directly with a long stare. Um, I replied in French that I wasn't familiar with his language, but he didn't seem to understand me. Um, anyway, so they, they keep talking in French. Um, and then, um, yeah, they try and explain who they are. Um, he listened. They got this, this man listens. But it uh, doesn't doesn't say anything. Um, <laughs> one resource still left was to speak English. I know we're now scraping the bottom of the barrel by going down to English. Uh, perhaps they would be familiar with this nearly universal language. Interesting observation back then. But I only knew it as I did the German language well enough to read it fluently and not enough to speak it correctly. Here, however, our overriding need was to make ourselves understood. Come on, it's your turn, I told the harpoon. Over to you, Mr. Land. Pull out of your bag of tricks the best English ever spoken by an Anglo-Saxon and try for more favourable result than mine. Anyway, so Ned then explains everything to these new guys in English. Um, but they, didn't understand, they don't understand English, apparently. 
Um, anyway, so um, Conseil volunteers to do the entire thing in German. <laughs> Off he goes. Uh, and finally, <laughs> Professor Aronnax, because he doesn't want to... It doesn't want to be out outshone by the rest of his crew. Not only has explained everything in French, but then des decides to narrate everything in Latin. <laughs> because why not? Um, Cicero would have plugged his ears and sent me to the scullery, but somehow I managed to pull through with the same negative results. So no matter what language they try and explain um, things in, these guys apparently don't understand what's going on. Um, anyway, so they... They, they talk in their incomprehensible language and then go back out again. Um, I ask you, says Ned Land, we speak English, we speak French, English, German and Latin to these rogues and even the decency to even answer back. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway, so more, more, more exposition. Um, my friends, I said, we mustn't despair. We've gotten out of tighter spots. Don't think you have, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this bit's quite funny. My views are fully formed, Ned Longchevac. They're rogues! Oh, good. Well, and for what country? Uh, Rogedom. <laughs> Whatever that might be. Um, so, there must be some southern blood in them, says uh, um, says Aranex. But whether they're Spaniards, Turks, Arabs or East Indians, their physical characteristics don't give me enough to go on. Uh, and for their speech, it's utterly incomprehensible. Um, anyway, so these people talk for quite a while. And then <laughs> there's another author's note here, just in case. Um, a steward entered. <laughs> By the way, a steward is a waiter on board a steamer. It doesn't explain what a steamer is. <laughs> a steamer nowadays, of course, is a small, um, a small like saucepan thing with a hole in the bottom where you put water in the bottom and it, <laughs> it steams your vegetables. But that's not what a steamer was in the 19th century. <laughs> a steamer is. <laughs> Basically, an ocean liner uh, that is powered by steam, hence the word a steamer. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's what he means. Um, so a steward is a waiter aboard a steamer. That's what a steward is. Um, anyway, so uh, he comes in and lays a place setting. <laughs> so I can have a meal. Uh, <laughs> a steamer in America is what the dog leaves on the lawn on a cold day. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Miner tends to agree. There's a Scottish equivalent of that. A steamer is an evacuation after a curry. <laughs> See, this is why I like having a multinational stream, an international stream. It's yeah, we get uh, so many variations on various different things. Anyway, so over, so anyway, so they get this nice meal set for them. Look, overlaid with silver dish covers, various platters have been neatly positioned on the tablecloth. We sat down to eat. So no hint. There's, interesting here. There's no hint of like actually, you know, we're we're going to uh, object and and not eat and demand an explanation. No, no, <laughs> they've set a silver service before us. We're going to sit down and enjoy ourselves. Um, so assuredly, we were dealing with civilized people. <laughs> Who had just pinched us off the top of their boat, jammed us in a cell, subjected us to darkness for half an hour, and then switched the light on and ignored us. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's fine. We'll just eat their food. It's like, just feels a bit odd, and a bit contrived, just a bit weird. Um, if it hadn't been the electric light, I would have thought we were dining with the Hotel Adelphi in Liverpool, or the Grand Hotel in Paris. However, I feel convention to mention that bread and wine were totally absent. Water was fresh and clear, but it was still water, which wasn't what Ned Land had in mind. Among the food served, I was able to identify daintily dressed fish. So they've always got a good cook on board. Um, couldn't make my mind up about otherwise things. And I couldn't tell whether their contents belonged to the vegetable or animal kingdom. And as for the tableware, tableware, it was elegant and in perfect taste. Each utensil, spoon, fork, knife and plate bore on its reverse a letter encircled by a Latin motto. And here is its exact duplicate. I have written it down. Mobilis and mobili. N. Um, oh, and there we go. That's just translation of uh, of the Latin. Moving within the moving element. Um, motion within movement. I think is that's my version. More pithy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it's a highly appropriate motto for the underwater machine. I think it probably is. I think it's good. It's a good motto, isn't it? Um, so, but Ned and Conseil are much more practical. They just eat their food. So, and then she, Aaron X joins them. Um, um, and then appetites appeased, um, we, <laughs> we settle down for a good night's sleep. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but Aranax has to has to go on thinking. I gave up less readily to this intense need for sleep. Too many thoughts had piled up our mind. Too many insoluble questions. Where were we? What strange power was carrying us along? Um, and etc. 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 So what? Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Anyway, um, so on to chapter nine. Um, there, yeah, they're still in the cell. Okay, so they stay. In the, <laughs> they stay in this cell for several, yeah, several chapters. Um, um, and he looks around the cell again. Nothing has changed. Um, and um, and then there's a little bit of explanation of why he's feeling a bit lightheaded. Uh, the heavy air was no longer sufficient for the full play of my lungs. So in essence, over an hour's time, a single human consumes all the oxygen found in 1,000 litres of air. Um, and um, so uh, <laughs> basically they're beginning to suffocate. Um, and then uh, Aranax is basically, again, a little bit a little bit of Jules Verne, I'm pretty darn good at science, is being injected here, as he starts talking about how you remove carbon dioxide from air using potassium chloride and uh, carbon dioxide with potassium hydroxide so it's all very, all very scientific which is which is quite good um how does he do it does he store it in high pressure tanks and so on and so forth so lots of <laughs> that's some good scientific detail um from from our man jules verne um <laughs> commander c to those like, i'm so bored let's rescue someone and ignore them to wind them up i know so yeah so early co2 scrubber so it's it, you know it's it's all sense now you know this is this is from an era of science fiction where it was important to explain how stuff worked because people didn't really know. Um, um, and then suddenly, suddenly the air is refreshed. Suddenly I was refreshed by a current of clean air scented with a salty aroma. It had to be a sea breeze, life giving and charged with iodine. <laughs> is, there, is there a lot of iodine in sea air? I was like, iodine? Really? Um, um, and then at the same time, I felt a swaying, a rolling of moderate magnitude, but definitely noticeable. The boat was up to the surface of the ocean um, and has, is, is exchanging its air. Uh, so that's quite, it's, it's quite a nice little technical touch. So basically it's showing that the, he's thought about the Nautilus, the way it works. You know, if it's under the water, then the air's going to go bad after a while. Um, and then there's, you know, basically the, the, he's basically exchanging the air kind of manually. Um, so that's uh, that's quite interesting. Um, um, so anyway, so <laughs> a little bit talk about is it dinner time? Is it lunch time? Is it breakfast time? Um, and um, <laughs> unless they're fattening us up, said Ned. Uh, anyway, it's still obsessed about cannibals. Um, so this this goes on for quite a long time actually there's an inconsequential conversation uh, to basically talking about food talking about what time of day it is uh, and whether or not they're nervous about what's going on and it takes quite, quite a long time before anything is and then professor aronax launches into well my theory about what's been going on is okay <laughs> um so um and then they do uh, finally, well, they do finally at this point um, start thinking, well, at least Ned does, um, you know, thinking about actually breaking out. <laughs> Been in here for like 24 hours and it's the first time anybody says, yeah, maybe we should try and escape. Uh, so, um, but I mean, it's, 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 yeah, the point is well made that, okay, well, you can break out of the cell maybe, but where are you going to go? Because you're on the submarine in the middle of the ocean. Um, so... <laughs> I don't know. Um, build a scrubber with what you've got. <laughs> so Vern is responsible for Apollo 13. Well, yeah. Mm. <laughs> a propose of our stream. Lots of waffle. It is indeed. Yeah. Um, and Conse is, is very practical here. He basically said, well, we're deep in the ocean. Being inside this boat is vastly pref preferable to being above it or below it. Yes. So there we go. Um, but Ned is Ned is still thinking. He says, "Right, well, in that, that case, we take over the craft." Well, uh, you know, so um, uh, <laughs> it's a slightly overwhelming view of his own uh, superiority. He says, "Some promising opportunity might come up, but I don't see what can stop us from taking advantage of it. If there are only about twenty men aboard this submarine, I don't think they can stave off two Frenchmen and a Canadian." <laughs> 
It's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like, okay, so you've got an ace, a king, a jack, and a spade. Well, I've got three, I've got two sixes and an eight. <laughs> um, very weird. Anyway, so um, <laughs> Professor Aronnax basically talks Mr. Land down and says, look, no, just calm down, calm down. <laughs> okay, don't don't get carried away and, and ask him for his word. Um, however, Ned is, Ned, is, Ned is on a bit of a short fuse. He's not, he's not, he's not happy. And he's getting hungry as well. Um, um, so anyway, they're just stuck in a cell. Nothing's happening. This is <laughs> it's quite strange, really. Uh, um, and now that now they're really really unhungry, it doesn't say anything interesting enough. It doesn't say anything in here about going to the loo, because I mean they've <laughs> they've been. I don't know. This is a practical. This is something that hardly ever happens in literature, is it? It certainly never happens on sci-fi shows. Um, but uh, you know there is um, <laughs> uh, there is yeah. <laughs> they've eaten some food. They've been in here for a day. Um, and uh, uh, and now they're starving, hungry, but there's there's been no mention of of, of the other side of the equation. Um, anyway, so this entire chapter um, is, um, is is them locked in the cell, just basically being starved. And then eventually the door opens, um, and the steward appeared. And before I could make a single movement to stop him, the Canadian rushed at the poor man, threw him down, and held him by the throat. Okay. Um, we thought they would be kind of potentially prepped for that, but clearly they weren't. Um, anyway, so Conseil is trying to loosen the harpooner's hands from the half-suffocated victim. Um, when does the other guy, the, you know, with the with the knotted eyebrows or the knotted forehead or whatever he's got, with the, with the eyes that are pointing in funny directions, um, uh, came to the uh, uh, he was nailed to the spot by these words pronounced in French. Calm down, Mister Land, and you, Professor. Kindly listen to me. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> so finally, finally here. They probably surreptitiously relieve themselves on the sea on the outside of the models. Yeah, but they've been in they've been in the cell for twenty four hours. So um <laughs> Gulliver and Lily put, uh, mentioned his causes. Now, interestingly enough, as an aside, in my latest book, um, which um, I'm working on the second draft at the moment, um, I do have a situation where somebody is caught in the hold of a ship and is locked down there. Um, and their captive just sort of makes fun of the fact that they're going to have to, you know, do number ones and number twos. <laughs> because it's like, well, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> I've kidnapped you. You're stuck in the hold. Do what you need to do. <laughs> And so I've actually made a small little sort of comedy out of it. Um, so, so there we go. Um, MKIX Hawk. Is this Jules Verne uh, 10,000 Leagues Under the Sea or, or something similar? It It is something similar. That is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So we are just working our way through as a sort of slightly humorous review of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. We are just finishing Chapter 9. Uh, <laughs> it's not the sequel, J.R. 1988. Behave yourself. Uh, <laughs> And the one after that, 40,000 leagues under the sea. Um, <laughs> uh, there. No. So 20,000 leagues under the sea by Jules Verne, a master of science fiction. And we are making a rather irreverent uh, tour of his, of his novel uh, because, because we can. And I'm sure you wouldn't mind. Uh, he's very welcome posthumously to review my books if he so wishes. But since he's dead and he hasn't turned up, uh, not much we can do about that. But anyway, chapter 10. Finally, we get to meet this this person this personage it was the in high capital letters um the ship's commander who had just spoken at these words ned land stood up quickly uh nearly strangled the steward staggered out <laughs> at the signal from his superior but such was the commander's authority upon his vessel not one gesture gave away the resentment that this man must have felt towards the canadian so he's very 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 disciplined um anyway so here's here's the first speech by 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 the by the by the commander of the vessel. Gentlemen, he said in a calm, penetrating voice, I speak French, English, German and Latin with equal fluency. Hence I could have answered you as early as our initial interview. But I first wanted to make your acquaintance and then think things over. Your four versions of the same narrative, perfectly consistent by and large, established your personal identities for me. I now know that sheer chance has placed in my presence Professor Pierre Aronnax, specialist in natural history with the Paris Museum, and entrusted with a scientific mission aboard his manservant, Conseil, and Ned Land. 
a harpooner of Canadian origin, aboard the Abraham Lincoln, a frigate in the National Navy of the United States of America. Bum, bum, bum. Um, no doubt, sir, you felt that I waited rather too long before paying this second visit. <laughs> Discovering your identities, I wanted to weigh carefully what policy to pursue toward you, and I had great difficulty deciding. Some extremely inconvenient circumstances have brought you into the presence of a man who has cut himself off from humanity, and your coming has disrupted my whole existence. Uh, so, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> it's... Um, uh, so we're basically introduced here to um, you know a man who has decided to cut himself off from humanity. He is rather arrogant, and uh, and uh, takes 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 his time to consider things. Um, unintentionally, said I. Um, was it unintentional that Abraham Lincoln hunted me on every sea? Um, and then was it unintentional that Mister Ledland hit me with a harpoon? Um, so anyway, so Professor Aronnax basically tries to explain. Well. <laughs> You've been charging around the sea without um, and ramming things. So, you know, what do you expect? <laughs> um, so, um, so um, the, yeah, he's trying to. He's he's, he's playing here with a. Um, you know, basically, I don't know what what um, what what this guy's trying to do here. Is he, is he trying to wind up Professor Aranex? Um, or not it's um so um you know, they're basically debating <laughs> are we the bad guys or are we the good guys so it's uh <laughs> it's curious um it's it's a very 19th century way of interacting with people so they're basically saying yeah, okay well you attack me no 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 you attacked us first no i didn't uh so <laughs> it kind of has a has a feel of that sort of thing um, I think the point of this passage is to basically um, make us question who basically it's that is uh, who's the bad guy here? Is it is it us or is it is it is it the people on board the submarine? Um, um, so um, anyway, so he basically comes to the conclusion. Actually, I'm a nice guy after all. So my natural compassion to which every human being is right. So basically, I am a good guy. So I'm gonna I'm gonna. <laughs> not going to murder you in cold blood um you will be free here in exchange for that freedom more totally related to it i'll lay on you just one condition so you're free you're entirely free you're entirely free but there's one condition okay uh go on sir i replied i assume this is a condition which an honest man can accept he says this better not be too bad this condition um Yes, just this. It is possible that certain unforeseen events may force you to force me to confine you to your cabins for some hours since I prefer never to use violence, I expect you in such a case, even more than any other, your unquestioning obedience. So basically you're entirely free, except when I choose to lock you up. Um, will you accept this condition? Um, so uh, there's no debate. <laughs> Professor Aronnax just agrees. Uh, <laughs> uh, we accept, I replied. Um, but could you just explain this for us? <laughs> uh, you said you would be free aboard this vessel. Yes, completely. What do you mean by this freedom? Freedom to come and go and closely observe everything. Um, in short, the freedom we selves are enjoy, my companions and I aboard the ship. Um, um, pardon me, sir, I went on, but that's merely the freedom that every prisoner has, the freedom to place itself. It's, 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 yeah, that is a good point, actually. That's a good point. Um, but... Um, <laughs> I think I would have said, I would have possibly debated this before I said, we accept. <laughs> um, you're entirely free, entirely free. You can't leave and you must go into the cell to tell you, but other than that, entirely free. Um, uh, merely the freedom that every prisoner has, the freedom to pace his cell. That's not enough for us. It will have to do. What? We must give up seeing our homeland, friends and relatives ever again? Yes, that's it. That's, that's my definition of freedom. Uh, <laughs> but giving up that intolerable earthly yoke that some men call freedom is perhaps less painful than you think. Now, there's a philosophical statement that could take, we could, we could take some time <laughs> to, to pull apart. Um, is freedom, is, it, is freedom worth it? Um, 
So, uh, yeah, so I accept your terms unquestionably, terms which I will now question. <laughs> it's a slightly curious way around that. Um, you're taking unfair advantage of this. This is sheer cruelty. Lots of exclamation marks. Look, there's one there, one there, one there, one there. <laughs> it's all over the place. Exclamation marks. Way too many exclamation marks. Um, I think that means it's a very exciting passage. Uh, no, sir, it's an act of mercy. You're my prisoners of war. I've cared for you when, with a single word, I could have plunged you back into the ocean depths. You attacked me. You stumbled on a secret. No living man must probe the secret of my entire existence. Do you think I'll send you back to a world that must know nothing more of me? Never. By keeping you on board, it isn't you whom I care for. It is me. OK, well, he's, he's honest there. Um... Then, sir, I went on, you give us simply quite a choice between life and death. Yes, quite simply. Um, um, and so, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's a slightly curious, curious thing. Um, um, and then, anyway, the guy continues. Oh, I have heard of you, Mr. Mr. Aronnax, Professor Aronnax. You, if not your companions, I won't complain too much about the stroke of fate. Um, anyway, so uh, he basically now basically says, um, you know, your captivity, your captivity will be bearable, Professor Aronnax, because I've got lots of stuff on board this this the ship that you're going to enjoy. <laughs> so, stunned amazement will probably be your habitual state of mind. Um, and um, starting this very day, you'll enter a new element. You see, new no human being has seen before. Um, since my men and I no longer count. And thanks to me, you're going to learn the ultimate secrets of our planet. So he's basically appealing to Professor Aronnax's sense of curiosity. And, uh, and of course, he takes the bait. I can't deny it. The commander's words had a tremendous effect on me. He had caught me on my weak side. I momentarily forgot that not even this sublime experience was worth the loss of my freedom. And besides, I counted on the future to resolve this important question. So I was content um, to reply. Um, um and finally finally we get introduced to the, the the name one last question i said just as this inexplicable being seemed ready to withdraw i ask it professor by what name am i to call you sir my commander replied to you i am simply captain nemo to me you and your companions are simply passengers on the nautilus uh, and then there's another <laughs> author's note um, that in Latin, Nemo means no one. Bum, bum, bum. Um, anyway, so then there's another meal. They like their food aboard the Nautilus, which is good. Um, and now, and, and so basically, Conse and Ned get given a uh, a nice meal, and Professor Aranax um, is to have uh, breakfast with Captain Nemo. Uh, wouldn't be my first question. Where's where's the loo? <laughs> so anyway, so um, now this is the first time we get to actually have a little bit of a tour of the inside of the Nautilus. So we've come, if you remember, we've come down from the top of the ship, um, down for a hatch and get immediately clunked into a cell. And then we are out in a corridor. OK, it doesn't say whether we're heading for or aft, unfortunately. Um, anyway, so I followed Captain Nemo, and as soon as I passed through the door, I went down that kind of electrically lit passageway that resembled a gangway on the ship. After a stretch of some 10 metres, a second door opened before me. So you kind of assume that there's a central corridor running down the length of the Nautilus. That's that's how I'm kind of um, seeing it. I then entered the dining room, decorated and furnished in austere good taste. In So <laughs> austere good taste in, in the 19th century was inlaid with ebony trim, tall oaken sideboards. So very, very, um, very dark, I'd imagine. Um, sparkling on the shelves were staggered rows of earthenware, porcelain and glass of incalculable value. Silver plated dinnerware gleamed under rays, pouring from light fixtures in the ceiling, whose glare was softened and tempered by delicately painted designs. Uh, in the centre of the room is a stable, rich, uh, table richly spread. Uh, be seated, I was told, and eat like the famished man you must be. So, um, more food, um, and then basically Captain Nemo explains where the food has come from. Um, a companion way, says Wintermute, saying, you know, waving the flag for nautical accuracy. Thank you very much there, Wintermute GB. Not a corridor, so it's a companion way. 
There we are. I was going to say it's <laughs> it's a very stable. It's got tables laid with cutlery and things, um, which I know ships could do, but yeah, they do they do get tossed about every time. Um, anyway, so he doesn't recognise some of the food, and he's he's queried about it. So, um, um, and Captain Nemo um, explains that basically it comes from the sea. Everything comes from the sea. And Captain Nemo never touches the flesh of land animals because reasons, right? Uh, so, um, um, so never left this anyway. So everything he points out that he thinks is from the land turns out to be from the sea. Um, um, and uh, I think uh, Captain Nemo is quite proud of this. He's, he goes on with it for some time. Uh, <laughs> And then um, lots of uh, lots of stuff. Now, um, who who's the who's the marine biologist on the stream? Because uh, this is this is probably your <laughs> this is your moment to start start telling us. This is Jules Verne. Oh, it's come the sea. There we go. Me, uh, <laughs> I've forgotten. Um, I I've got no idea if any of this was was. Well, I mean, it won't be accurate now because you know, hundred and something years has gone by. But you know, was it accurate then? <laughs> I mean, I mean, um, Captain Nemo starts talking about four zeophyte groups, uh, classes of articles, five classes of mollusks, three invertebrate classes, mammals, reptiles. This is this is a proper breakfast conversation, isn't it? <laughs> Blue Ganymede, you skipped over the bit where they eat some. Do they? Do, where do they eat some dolphin? Oh, I missed that. Oh yeah, some dolphin livers. Uh, <laughs> not sure. That's not good. Um, and here's cream for milk furnished by the udders of cetaceans and sugar from the huge, uh, <laughs> the, the Fuca's plants and the North Sea. Um, a marmalade of sea anemones. So <laughs> I don't know quite what those sort of things, whether that's even possible. Uh, but there we go. Um, the perfumes you'll find on the wash down of your, your cabin were produced from the oozings of marine plants. Nice. The mattress was made from the ocean's softest eel grass. Is eel grass, I think? I think. Your quill pen will be whalebone. Your ink, a juice secreted by cuttlefish or squid, which I suppose is practical. Um, everything comes to me from the sea. Um, <laughs> Commander Sea Dweller. Oh, so eelgrass is real, right? OK. Uh, I'm disappointed, Commander Sea Dweller, that you can't remember the number of known things in the mid-19th century. <laughs> so, what have you been doing all week in preparation for this stream, if you haven't been researching this? Uh, anyway... <laughs> It's a very impressive menu of stuff. But basically the point here is that Captain Nemo feels it very, very important to explain that nothing in the Nautilus comes from land. OK, it comes from the sea only. Um, um, so, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I would be all that keen on some of the food, but uh, there we go. So, um um, but yeah, so there's a, we, we get an insight into Captain Nemo here. The sea is a vast pool of nature. Our globe began with the sea, so to speak, and who can say we won't end with it? Here lies supreme tranquility. The sea doesn't belong to tyrants, implying that the land does. On its surface, they can still exercise the iniquitous claims, battle each other, devour each other, haul every earthy horror. But 30 feet below sea level, their dominion ceases. Their influence fades, their power vanishes. Ah, sir! Live, live in the heart of the seas. Here alone lies independence. Here I recognise no superiors. Here I am free, with my massive collection of exclamation marks. <laughs> so no, I mean to be honest, there's there's lots of tasty things in the sea. Uh, I've got a problem there. I mean it's, it's just an odd odd list um, of <laughs> things for breakfast, particularly. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, but now here, here we get into some, some science fiction-y stuff, right? Okay, chapter 11, the Nautilus. Now Professor said, if you'd like to inspect the Nautilus, I'm yours to command. So now we actually get a tour of the ship. At last, this amazing vessel. Um, so Captain Nemo stands up. Um, contrived at the rear of the dining room, another door opened up. Into the room whose dimensions equal the one I just left. So it's, it's got an awful lot of space, has the Nautilus. And here he has a library, okay? Black rosewood bookcases inlaid with copper work, um, huge couches in maroon leather. <laughs> it's like a it's like a smoking room. Um, 
lower parts into huge couches, uh, light movable reading stands, which could be pushed away. And it sounds, sounds just delightful, doesn't it? Um, in the center stood a huge table covered in pamphlets, which among which were some newspapers long out of date. Uh, electric light flooded this whole harmonious totality, falling from four frosted half globes set in the scrollwork of the ceiling. So he's no expense spared on the interior furnishings of the Nautilus. Uh, <laughs> Travel to strange new worlds to seek out new life under the seas and eat it all. Um, so, um, Captain Nemo, I told my host, who had just stretched out on the couch, this is a library that would do credit to more than one continental palace. Um, anyway, so he's, <laughs> there's enough room on the Nautilus, apparently, to have um, 12,000 books. Okay. <laughs> which, is, which is a lot of books. Okay. Um, um, my sole remaining ties with dry land. Um, that day I purchased my last volumes, my last pamphlets, my last newspapers, and ever since then I've chosen to believe that humanity no longer thinks or writes. In any event, Professor, these books are at your disposal and you may use them freely. So, um, um, so uh, Captain Nemo has a big library, basically. <laughs> um, it's interesting what gets mentioned here, actually. Um, all the, the odd detail, all these books were shelved indiscriminately without regard to the language in which they were written. This jumble proved that Nautilus Captain could read fluently whatever volumes he chose to pick up. So he's fluent in all the different languages. So amongst these books, OK, so he has um, Homer to Victor Hugo, Xenophon to Michelet, uh, Magellet to Madame Georges Sand. Um, lots of science about um, mechanics, ballistics, hydrography, meteorology, geography, geology. Humboldt, um, Foucault, Henri Saint Clair de Ville. It just goes on and on and on and on. And on. Um, um, plus the transactions of France's Academy of Science. Yeah, so there's a there's a lot of stuff here. Is 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 Nemo? Uh, yeah, it's Nemo, Captain Messer. It's a pretty ungodly TBR list. Yeah, there is. Any Jeffrey? <laughs> Have you got any Mills and Boone? <laughs> Um, amongst the works of Joseph Bertrand, the book entitled The Founders of Astronomy, um, which came out in 1865. So, uh, and Professor Aronnax is, is smart here. Um, Fifty Shades of Blue. <laughs> uh, um, um, anyway, so um, um, he, he's basically guessing that Captain Nemo has been on the Nautilus for about three years, based on the publication date of of the book. Has he got a copy of Shadewood? No, alas, I don't think I don't think he has. Um, um, anyway, it turns out it is a. It doesn't even look. It doesn't just look like a smoky room. It in fact is a smoky room, and you can smoke on board. Now I don't know. <laughs> don't know about modern uh, um, submarines. <laughs> I'm assuming it's not. Um, it, it, I mean, is it? Are you allowed to smoke on board a submarine? <laughs> Sounds like potentially quite dangerous thing to do uh i don't know is that is that, is that are they banned it in 2010 wow is it only that recently okay um anyway so the nautilus is far more civilized they can have cigars on board uh but of course it's not a it's not a cuban cigar it's 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 um um a nicotine rich seaweed <laughs> Fly fishing by J.R. Hartley. Um, so Russian subs still let them smoke, maybe. Okay. I've not been on a sub. I've never smoked underwater, though. <laughs> this is very tricky in scuba gear. Put them. Anyway, so you can get nicotine rich seaweed that uh, makes half decent supplies of cigars. Um, right. So just then, Captain Nima opened a door facing the one by which I had entered. So. Um, from what I've worked out here, we were probably near the front of the machine. Uh, we come down the hatch in the um, in the in, in the top of the submarine, down into a in a into a companionway. Let me get that, get 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 this right, um, which is where the cell is. Then we've gone back out of the cell, down the companionway. We first end up in the uh, kind of kitchen area. Then we end up in the library. And then we go back from the library um, into, into into a museum. <laughs> it's 
quite an impressive, quite an impressive design of submariners. Um, so you know, breakfast at the front, then back, back a little bit. Yeah, you, know, you know, basically padded cell. Well, basically the lockup is the front. Okay, uh, <laughs> where the cells are. Then you come back from there into the breakfast room. Uh, then there's the library. Then there's the museum. Um, um, anyway, so there's all sorts of uh, you know pictures here. Uh, you know Leonardo da Vinci, <laughs> Rubens, all sorts of stuff. So basically, you know a whole bunch of really expensive artwork and and things. Um, um, uh, and you know basically Nemo says he's a collector of fine art. So there's 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 plenty of stuff. Um, and then there's sheet music by Mozart, Beethoven, Rossini, uh, <laughs> Wagner. Uh, <laughs> there's a full-sized piano organ in here as well. Um, uh, so anyway, so he's you know he likes his he likes his music. So he's basically you know he's he's a bit like us actually. You know he's you know he's got his he's got his he's got his books. He's got his food and he's got his museum of fine art and some music. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty good life. Um, so, um, yeah, and a full size. I mean, what, what is a piano organ? I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty big thing, right? Um, a full size piano organ in a submarine. That's probably never been done. Um, anyway, so after the works of art, I mean, this, this museum bit of the ship must be pretty big. Um, you know, he's got, you know, there's a giant clam in there. Um, there's basins and, you know, there's, <laughs> there's displays of sponges, the displays of all sorts of things. Um, and, um, you know, um, you know, oysters, um, <laughs> it's just stuff. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, the inside of the Nautilus is, is, a, is a thing I wonder. Um, in special compartments, you know, bells are spread out. So yeah, it's got everything on display and, you know, it's quite, um, quite impressive. Um, so, um, so, you know, we get we get a nice picture here of of what the inside of the Nautilus, this is an artist's impression of the inside of the Nautilus here. So um, they're smoking away. Basically, it's a it's it's an underwater gentleman's club. As, as far as I can work out, um, so there we go. Um, so um, um, anyway, he kind of assures you because he's he's you know he's interested in all this stuff. It, uh, but he says it's um, my curiosity is about the motor power. So come on, come on, Mister Nemo, show us how the damn thing works. Uh, <laughs> that's the bit we're interested in. Um, um, I see instruments hanging on the walls of this land whose purposes are unknown to me. Ah, well, I said you'll be free aboard my vessel. No part of the is off limits. You may inspect it in detail. I'd like to act as your guide. Um, so you've seen some gauges, presumably, on the on the on the wall. So I followed Captain Nemo, who var one of the doors cut in the lounge's canted corners. Um so sort of an sort of, sort of angle to the normal normal dimension of the room. He led me back down to the ship's gangways. OK, right. So um, um, now he's gone to the bow. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it'd be interesting. Does anybody actually have? I wonder, <laughs> wonder if there is. Is there is there a floor plan of the Nautilus? <laughs> because <laughs> I'm a bit lost. Um, Let's see if anybody's, anybody's built one. I mean, that's the Disney version. Um, there's, a, there's a plaque there, but um, you know, does anybody? <laughs> Here we go. Right. <laughs> uh, some fans have obviously tried to figure it out. Uh, so it's got multiple decks. OK, that sort of makes sense. Um, so let's have a look. OK, so we've got deck deck B here. OK, so uh, we have a wheelhouse, um, chart room, saloon, passageway, pump room, secondary lockout chamber, diving chamber, power compartment, freshwater storage, Nemo's cabin. None of which we <laughs> has been referred to as yet. Um, so let's let's have a look at that one. 
Okay, here we go. Right, so Nemo's cabin is apparently right at the front. Um, Ned and Conseil's cabin is there. There's Aranax's cabin. There's the pilot's cabin. This is the saloon. There's <laughs> okay, so this this must be the Disney version, right? Um, uh, is, is there a is there a toilet on the dock? I can't see one. There's a crew shower. Maybe that maybe that sort of doubles up in a weird sort of way. Um, there's no sign of the museum there. There's you know, there's there's um, there's another one there. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, there's a few attempts basically um, to kind of figure out where all the rooms were, but um, um, I don't I don't think it doesn't look like there's a definitive floor plan uh, <laughs> for the Nautilus. Uh, I'm afraid. So we're going to have to kind of work with it. Okay. So, so I don't know. Yeah, you know, were we heading towards the back of the ship, and then they turned around, and it, he took me to the bow. And there I found not just a cabin, but an elegant stateroom with a bed, a washstand, and, th and various other furnishings. Um, your stateroom adjoins mine, he told me, opening and Mine leads into the lounge we've just left. Okay, so hang on a bit. Which is the lounge? Um, <laughs> not sure if we can figure out which way around. <laughs> this goes. So are we saying that the bow is basically the rooms and they lead back into the lounge we've just left so is the lounge that we just left is that the the lounge is the the lounge is the museum -y bit isn't it okay where he has all his stuff so actually okay so we've kind of we must have been at the back of the boat i think so i think i'm right saying that when we're in the in the cells must be at the back you go forward into the kitchen area or the possibly the eating area then you go forward into the library then you go forward into the lounge and then you go forward into the sleeping rooms or the state rooms um, now the state rooms contain a, a bed a wash stand and various other furnishings so i think my friends we may <laughs> we may have found the lose okay <laughs> um so and he gives different names, given different, different, <laughs> different names of different parts of the room. Um, um, not very nautical names, actually. Yeah. So brig, galley, stern. Um, as I recall, says on the left, it's believed the original Nautilus internal layout is dimensionally inconsistent. I think that's quite probably accurate. But I do think we've probably found the loo or the head. I think as it's called on on ships. Um, <laughs> I can only thank my host. <gasps> I found the loo at last. So I think various other furnishings is is basically as as close as that as we're going to get. Um, right, so um, Captain Nemo has a room quite close as well, um, and the captain's stateroom has an austere, almost monastic appearance: an iron bedstead, a work table, some washdown fixtures, some viewed lighting, no luxuries, and just the bare essentials. And then we get an explanation. Okay, so now we get some exposition. Um, there are so some gadgets on the walls of the stateroom, some busy some gauges and levers and things. Um, these are the devices needed to navigate the Nautilus. Here, as in the lounge, I have always I always have them before my eyes, and they indicate my position and exact heading in the midst of the ocean. You're familiar with some of them, such as the thermometer, you know what that is, uh, which gives the temperature inside the Nautilus. Uh, the barometer, which measures the heaviness of the outside air and forecasts changes in the weather. Um, the humidis humidistat which indicates the degree of dryness in the atmosphere. Now we now, nowadays call that a um, just a humidity meter, but a humidity stat will do. Um, the storm glass, uh, which mixture decomposes to foretell the arrival of tempest. Now I've actually got one of those. Um, <laughs> um, Admiral, I uh, know, Captain somebody's storm glass. So those of you who haven't seen a storm glass, um, it is it's one of these, okay? Um, a Fitzroy. This is what I've, I've got one of these, okay? A Fitzroy storm glass. Now, the idea behind the storm glass is that there's some, I don't know what's, what's actually in it. It's got some weird chemicals in it, right? Okay. And um, it's it's basically a tube. It's like an upside, upside down test tube um, on, a, on a wooden base. And inside it is, is some combination of weird chemicals, right? And the idea is that um, you can forecast 
bad weather or the type of bad weather that's coming by having a look in here and working out whether or not the liquid's gone cloudy or whether there's um you know whether there's crystals pointing up in it and um stuff right um i can confirm okay that um okay so here we <laughs> basically here okay so if the liquid in the glass is clear the weather will be bright and clear if the liquid is cloudy the, the weather will be cloudy okay if there are small dots in the liquid hum humid or foggy weather can be expected a cloudy glass with small stars indicates thunderstorms if the liquid contains small stars on sunny winter days then snow is coming if there are large flakes for that liquid it will be overcast in temperate seasons or snowy in the winter and if there are crystals at the bottom this indicates frost and if there are threads near the top it will be windy okay um um having observed mine okay having observed mine uh, throughout many different tempests of very different types of magnitude throughout a considerable period of time i can confirm without a shadow of a doubt that it's utter box <laughs> okay it's a very is a very curious thing to have okay uh because it's quite cute and it's quite fun and it's it's old fashioned and it looks good. It's a good conversation starter, but it does not work. All right. <laughs> You're far better off with a weather forecast, let me assure you. Um, um, anyway, so apparently many small fishing communities around the British Isles still use them for consultation <laughs> before setting sail. All right. <laughs> um, so, anyway, I don't know what's got in it. Um, the state, what, what is it? Um, it doesn't say compositions of liquid in storm cars varies, but usually contains camphor, nitrate of potassium and sal almanac dissolved by alcohol with some water and some air. <laughs> Let's just chuck some random things in a test tube. Um, <laughs> Wikipedia says here, these devices are now known to have little value in weather prediction, but continue to be a curiosity, <laughs> which is exactly right. Uh, so that's what a storm glass is. I do actually have one and it doesn't work. <laughs> Glenn's weather rock. I have a weather telly rock, says Glenn. It's wet, it's rainy. If it's white, it's snowing. If it's dry, it's sunny. If it's not there, it's extremely windy. <laughs> so yeah, let's let's vote for Glenn's weather rock. There's 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 one of those at I think at um, Land's End in the UK, which is um, um what is it? Weather forecasting stone. <laughs> I'm sure it will show up. Uh, um, where is it here? Um, there we go. John's weather forecasting stone. Stone is wet, rain. Stone is dry, not raining. Uh, shadow on ground, sunny. White on top, snow. Can't see stone, foggy. Swinging stone, windy. Stone jumping up and down, earthquake. Stone gone, tornado. There we go. <laughs> um, um, I've got a ga yes, I've got a Galileo thermometer as well. That does actually work. Yeah, so Galileo's thermometer is actually based on some actual, <laughs> actual science, um, as opposed to the storm glass, which basically isn't. Um, anyway, so Jules Verne obviously thought the storm glass. Now that's a pretty handy thing to have aboard the Nautilus. So there was one. Um, <laughs> reminds me of Pratchett's dragon detector, which consisted solely of a piece of wood on a metal stick, and when the stick was burned through, you found your dragon. Yep, that makes sense to me too. Anyway, so that's John's weather forecasting stone, which is actually more accurate than the storm glass. Um, uh, anyway, so for some reason, Captain Nemo hasn't established that the storm glass isn't of any use, uh, and he's still got one. The compass. Yes, of course, you're going to need a compass, which is, of course, the sextant, which allows me to take the sun's altitude and tells me my latitude. Um, and um, I've got one of those as well. Very, very tricky things to use, um, sextants. But they do work. I have actually got one and learned how to use it out of sheer morbid curiosity. Um, interesting enough, he's got this bang on. Um, so, um, sextant, which allows me to take the sun's attitude, altitude and tells me my latitude. So basically what you do with a sextant is you measure the height of the sun consistently as near to midday as you can. And whatever the maximum altitude of the sun is, that's your latitude. Which is which is which is how you find your latitude. Um, 
Um, and, and this bit is interesting. Chronometers, which allow me to calculate my longitude, which is correct. So basically, the, the way you calculated your longitude back then, before GPS, was that you had to have two clocks, basically. A reference clock, which was on um, a known land location, let's say GMT or some other city. Um, and then you'd basically set your current clock by the time, again, that midday occurred. And the difference between the two clocks would tell you how far east or west of your originating point you were. So that's how longitude was calculated. So a couple of extra points here, therefore, for Jules Verne for getting this, uh, <laughs> it's this correct. Um, so, um, so yeah, so chronometers are used well before Jules Verne. So yeah, if you haven't, <laughs> <laughs> We've given Verne enough latitude. Very good there, we debute. Very good indeed. Now, if you haven't read um, on the on the subject of longitude, um, the book called Longitude. <laughs> you can tell what it's about. Um, 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 this is this is an excellent book. If you're at all geeky um, about it, um, this book here by Darva Sabel. Um, publication actually in 1995 it's quite a while ago now um i can i can thoroughly recommend this book okay um he basically talks about um this chap john harrison who invented the marine chronometer and all the struggles he has about inventing the marine chronometer uh, it is an excellent excellent book um very readable for a non-fiction book okay uh, very very readable and good there is also an illustrated version which i've got as well which is very very um uh, very, very, um, uh, you know, very worth reading. And if you do live in the UK and you get an opportunity, go to the um, uh, Greenwich Observatory and you can go and look at the timepieces that John Harrison made, which basically did crack the longitude problem. And the longitude problem basically was because they didn't have accurate clocks uh, before this point, because you couldn't take a pendulum clock out to see because it wouldn't run properly. They did basically, <laughs> they had the same problem they had in my Shadewood saga. The moment you sail out of sight of land, you have no idea where you were. Um, so there, there are quite a few ships that kind of came a cropper in the night when they thought they were far from land and turned out that they weren't and ran into the shore in the middle of the dark or you know, ended up on a reef somewhere. So quite a lot of people died because um, of this longitude problem. And, um, you know, or, you know, didn't have enough resources to get to their destinations of all, all sorts of stuff like that. Right. Um, and so the longitude problem for, for, for decades and decades and decades in nautical terms was one of those unsolvable missions. Well, if you could solve the longitude problem, then, yeah, you could solve anything. Um, and so. Um, so eventually this guy turns up and makes a clock, basically, that works on board a, sh a, a ship. He. he um, so um, longer, yeah, longitude book. Go and look it up if you if you if you like that sort of stuff. It's 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 a bit of a tragic story actually as well, but um, go read it. It's 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 a really good read. So I can thoroughly recommend longitude. Um, but you know, full props to Jules Verne for getting his latitude and longitude right. So that's really good. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, there's a diversion there, right? So let's get back onto the Nautilus. Um, he's got spy glasses, which is the old-fashioned word for telescope. I don't know why they call them spy glasses, but there we are. Um, those are the normal navigation instruments, and I'm familiar with their uses. So he's seen those before, as Professor Aaron X. Um, and that dial I see with a needle moving across it, it's a pressure gauge, is it not? It is indeed. OK, so it tells um, Captain Nemo how deep the Nautilus is going. Um, and are these suit numbers uh, some new breed of sounding line? So thermometric sounding lines that report water temperatures in different strata. Um, um, anyway, so there are, there's but there's some other instruments that Professor Aronnax doesn't recognise. Okay, um, now here, Professor, I will need to give you some background information, says Captain Nemo. So kindly hear me out. There is a powerful, obedient, swift, and effortless force that can be bent to my use and which reigns supreme aboard my vessel. It does everything. It lights me, it warms me, it is the soul of my chemical equipment. This force is electricity, because electricity is shiny and new in the 19th century, and it's awesome stuff. <laughs> okay, electricity, I exclaim in some surprise. Yes. Um, but Captain, you have tremendous speed of movement. That doesn't square with the strength of electricity. Uh, 
Professor Aronnax has clearly never been in a Tesla. Uh, <laughs> until now, its dynamic potential has remained quite limited, capable of producing only small amounts of power. Ha <laughs> ha ha, says Professor Nemo. Ah, ah, ah. My electricity isn't the run-of-the-mill variety. <laughs> I've got special electricity. Uh, and with your permission, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> what, what, what? No, I won't resist there, but I'll rest content with simply being flabbergasted at your results. Um... The electric cells used to generate its marvellous force must be depleted very quickly. So how does it work? Yeah, what do you store it in? Etc, <laughs> etc, etc. Et um, um, anyway, so Captain Nemo has basically mined zinc, iron, silver and gold. Not sure what gold is useful for electricity, but... Um, so um, the sea itself somehow charges the ship. Okay, so... There was no shortage of sources. In fact, by establishing a circuit between two wires immersed to different depths, I'd be able to obtain electricity through the diverging temperatures they experience. OK, so he could have charged his ship, apparently, um, by um, um, by putting, <laughs> basically plugging it into the sea, <laughs> which I don't think works. Uh, there might be. <laughs> Might be a small voltage differential between different levels of seawater, but I don't think it's a great deal. Uh, I don't think you can run a submarine off it anyway. Windy Butte GB, gold for conductors. Um, yes, that's that's a good one, because of course gold doesn't react with anything, does it? Good point, good point. Um, but anyway, so apparently it's not that. You're familiar with the composition of salt water. Okay, so it's mostly water and a bit of sodium chloride and small quantities of other stuff. Okay, I won't go through all the, all the chemistry here. Um, um, it's the sodium that I extract from salt water and with which I compose my electric cells. So sodium. Now, I don't know enough about chemistry here to say how well this is correct or not. OK, so it's sodium. It basically takes sodium out of seawater. Uh, well, I mean, you could get the sodium chloride out of seawater fairly easily, just let by drying it off. But how you get the sodium out of that, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, he then mixes it in mercury. So mercury and sodium, which <laughs> sounds incredibly dangerous if you ask me, uh, <laughs> forms an amalgam that takes the place of zinc in Bunsen cells. The mercury is never depleted. Only the sodium is consumed and the sea gives me that. Beyond this, I'll mention the sodium batteries have been found to generate the greater energy. An electromotor said this twice that of zinc batteries. OK, so zinc batteries. Um, OK, <laughs> uh, it's electrolysis. OK, so you use electricity to make sodium out of seawater that then use to create more energy. That's that doesn't sound right. Um, so ocean thermal energy is a real thing. Nemo is just a century ahead. OK, so uh, I asked electric eels how they did it and they wouldn't tell me. Um, so, I mean, a zinc, I mean, there are zinc batteries. I've never heard of a sodium battery. Is that is that a thing? Um, so basically, so uh, Professor Aranex um, asks asks a good question here. So where do you how do you get the sodium out? Obviously, your batteries could do the extracting, but if I'm not mistaken, the consumption of sodium needed by electric equipment would be greater than the quantity you'd extract. Yeah, otherwise, it would be a perpetual motion machine. Um, it would come about then in the process of producing your sodium, use up more than you make. Ah, well. OK, so I don't extract it with batteries. I utilise the heat of the coal from the earth. From the earth, I said. Well, from the sea floor, if you prefer. So basically, um, um, he it doesn't explain what he uses the coal for, um, but somehow the coal allows him to extract the sodium, which he then uses to generate electricity, and the sodium is consumed in some fashion. Um, he could produce the air on board needed, but it'd be pointless because he basically rises to the surface of the sea to go and get it. Um, and so, uh, and he can store it in special tanks and he can stay down, low, uh, down in the sea longer as a result of that. So it's, yeah, the, the Nautilus has the surface to replenish its air. And over, over time, it needs to have its energy topped up with sodium. He uses coal to extract from, from, from something. So I'm not quite sure how it works. Um, OK, so Mad Monks Off says that uh, um, sodium ions as a battery might work. OK, so it's quite close to a lithium ion battery. Um, so 
um, but there are better options now. So actually, he's he's not too he's not too bad, is he, old Jules Verne on that? So sodium ion batteries are a thing. They presumably maybe weren't a thing back then. Um, um, anyway, so he's uh, um, you know he's got a clock that runs on electricity. Um, uh, it runs with an accuracy rivaling the finest chronometers. Actually, if it's an electric clock, clock it'll be a hell of a lot more accurate. <laughs> than any kind of mechanical clock so that's quite good um he's got a 24 hour clock um um the dial before our eyes indicates how fast the nautilus is going so he's got a speedometer as well um and um so uh yeah basically it's it'll it's taken the place of wind steam and water um and then we go to have a look at the nautilus's stern okay so basically, we figured out that he's for now familiar with the whole front part of the boat. OK, and so the, here, here he tries to describe the internal layout. So Jules Verne obviously had an idea here. Um, his exact subdivision is going from amidships to its spur. The dining room five metres long and separated from the library by a watertight bulkhead. Um, the library five metres long. The main lounge is 10 metres long. Uh, there's a stateroom five metres long. Um, air tanks 7.5 meters long a total length of 35 meters okay so it doesn't now sound as big as it did um, doors were cut into the watertight bulkheads and were he shut hermetically by means of india rubber seals um, which ensured complete safety board the nautilus in the event of a leak in any one section so this is before um, um, vulcanization of rubber i think um, so india rubber was the best that they had which is which is, is, is fair enough um so um uh, so so there we go anyway so so Jules Verne has has had a reasonable stab at stuff I, th I think we can give him credit for that yeah I think if if any of us were writing science fiction now and it was being picked apart by some <laughs> irritating twitch streamer 150 years in the future uh, if any of our stuff <laughs> makes any sense at all uh, I think we'd be doing pretty well so I mean let's let's not be too harsh on <laughs> on poor old Jules Verne. He had some pretty damn good ideas, to be honest, given that he's writing in 1895, whatever it was. So uh, we, we can't be too cruel to him. He's going go to... Anyway, so apparently uh, Captain Nemo also has a skiff, um, a little longboat, um, which he can then row off to visit things. So he's got he's got like a captain's yacht. It's not a yacht, but you know what I mean. Um, um, and it's, it's in a cavity completely designed to... Um, receive it so it doesn't affect the uh, hydrodynamics of the, uh, the the submarine when it's moving along okay so and but he's also this is this is quite cool he's also got a remote control okay there's no there's no wi-fi talked about here there's no radio waves but uh, there's an electric wire that connects me to the ship he, fi he fires off a telegram <laughs> and the ship can can be controlled by remote control i mean that's pretty I'm quite impressed by that that's pretty far pretty far forward thinking um you know he can basically command the nautilus by a little remote control it's not wi-fi it's not wireless but you know it's connected by a wire um I don't know what happens if the wire is accidentally severed um but anyway there we go um so um anyway so <laughs> and we see Conseil and Ned who is still eating Okay, well, this has been going on. Um, electricity did cooking. So under the stoves, wires transmitted to platinum griddles, uh, heat that was distributed, maintained with perfect consistency. So electricity is just this just clearly the future. Okay, um, uh, distilling mechanism supplies drinking water. There's a bathroom. There is a bathroom at last, uh, with faucets supplying hot or cold water at will. So this is well kitted out. Okay, uh, is the um, is the Nautilus. Um, then there's the crew quarters. Then there's a fourth watertight bulkhead. And then there's the engine room. Bam, bam, bam. At last we get to see how this thing works. Um, and I, the door opened and I stood in the compartment where Captain Nemo, indisputably a world-class engineer, had set up his locomotive equipment. Brightly lit, the engine room measured at least 20 metres in length. So that's a fair chunk of the entire ship, actually. It was divided by function into two parts. The first contained the cells for generating electricity, and the second, the mechanism that transmitted the movement to the propeller. Um, right off, I detected an odour permeating the compartment that was 
sui generis, uh, which is Latin for a class in itself. Captain Nemo noticed the negative impression it made on me. That, he says, is a gaseous discharge caused by our use of sodium. But it's only a mild inconvenience. In any event, every morning we sanitise the ship by ventilating in the open air. It's just a really nice way of saying it stinks a bit. <laughs> anyway, so meanwhile I observed the Nautilus engine with a fascination easy to imagine. Now, um, you observe, Captain Nemo says, I use Bunsen cells, not Rumkorf cells. Now, Rumkorf was quite an interesting inventor. He's referenced in quite a lot of other Jules Verne titles, notably um, Journey to the Centre of the Earth. So Rumkorf was kind of a big deal, I think, back at this period of history. Um, but clearly Bunsen cells, which I don't know um, um, much about, um, is... Um, um, uh, yeah, Bunsen cells are better than Rumkorf cells by this point. Uh, the electricity generated here makes its way to the stern, where electromagnets of huge size activate a special system of levers and gears that transmit motion, movement to the propeller shaft. The latter has a diameter of 6 metres, a pitch of 7.5 metres, and can do up to 120 revolutions per minute. Um, and that gives you a speed of 50 miles per hour. OK, so... Again, so there are cells, uh, which are effectively batteries. Um, electromagnets of a huge size activate a special system of special levers and gears. So that's pretty pretty good. It's definitely going to be electromagnets. Um, uh, Madbox says, says a Bunsen cell is a zinc carbon primary cell composed of a zinc anode and a dilute sulfuric acid separated by a porous pot from a carbon cathode in nitric or chromic acid. Excellent. So clearly it was a thing. Um, now, 50 miles an hour... OK, how fast can a modern... Does anybody know? I think I asked this question last week. How fast can a modern submarine go? Um, 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 that's 50, 50 miles an hour for anything on the sea um, is <laughs> it's insanely quick, isn't it? Uh, 50 miles an hour in water is pretty damn fast. Um, so, yeah, and, and does he mean knots or does he actually mean 50 miles per hour? Um, I wonder what the original translation means. Anyway, so 35 miles per hour is the record, Google says. So nothing nothing modern has gone more than 35 miles an hour. That's 50 miles an hour. It's just like, that's just star straight. That's, that's just basically warp speed um, compared to anything. Um, so there we go. Um, so... Um, so interesting enough, electromagnets activate a special system of levers and gears. So it's not a kind of direct drive submarine. Um, so, um, so yeah. So anyway, that's 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 pretty impressive stuff if you can do fifty miles now. There lay a mystery, but I didn't insist on exploring it. How could electricity work with such power? How can it be done? Uh, where did this nearly unlimited energy originate? Was it an extraordinary voltage obtained by some new kind of induction coil? Uh, could its transmission have been immeasurably increased by some unknown system of levers? And uh, another author's note. Sure enough, there's now talk of such a discovery in which a set of levers generates considerable power. Did this inventor meet up with Captain Nemo? I don't know what that's all about. Um, anyway, Captain Nemo said, I vouch for the results and try not to explain them. I've seen the Nautilus at work out in front of the Abraham Lincoln. I know where I stand on its speed. But it isn't just enough to move. We have to see where we're going. We must be able to steer left or right or up or down. How do you reach the lower depths where you meet an increasing resistance that is assessed in hundreds of atmospheres? How is it done? How do you rise back to the surface of the ocean? How do you keep your ship at whatever level suits you? Am I indiscreet in asking you all these things? I have so many questions. Not at all, Professor, the captain answered me after long hesitation. Since you never leave this underwater boat, I'll tell you come into the lounge and I'll explain the full story of the Nautilus. Bum, bum, bum. So, we know it's run by electricity. Um, <laughs> um, and um, it's pretty damned impressive. Uh, it's got lots of instruments on board. There's there's loads of stuff on board, um, and um, yeah, it's 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 an impressive. Machine. So, as a, for a sort of science fiction undertaking, you can see why this was. Um, um quite exciting story at the time because it's like here's a here's a here's an amazing thing and jules verne hasn't just said you know here's a magic submarine he's actually tried pretty hard um um to kind of explain 
uh, how it works and make it make it plausible. So I think for what is effectively a piece of science fiction. Now, when, when was okay? So we here we are in eighteen ninety five. When was the first working submarine built? That's that's another Wikipedia question. Uh, <laughs> when was the first working submarine that we would recognise as a submarine? Is that World War One? Um, or was it before the book? So, you know, but from a submarine that could do what Nau the Nautilus is describing. Um, so 1865 says Wintermute, 1562. Yeah, but I'm talking about a submarine that you know, has all the elements that Nautilus, Nautilus has, i.e. the ability to navigate, the ability to move at speed, you know, to have, you know, rooms on board that, you know, civilised. Um, well, no submarines ever done. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about a recognisable submarine that, um, you know, has has steering gear, has a screw at the back, you know, has motive power all of its own, can rise and dive and all those sort of things, all under its own control. Um, so I was going to say it's sort of World War One onwards, isn't it? Um, maybe even World War Two. So uh, you know those that sort of it. So you know he's he's projecting into the future quite impressively. I think I think we still have to give Jules Verne some pretty um, you know pretty loud round of applause because um, okay so the French built a failed submarine called the Nautilus in 1800. Um, Wikipedia USS Holland, the SS1. The end of the American Civil War was used one that rammed other ships. Okay, so it's so he's he's basically extrapolating from a known position, but he's transposed in some electricity to make it even cooler, um, and um, you know made made for quite a compelling thing. And you know, you know, I think the fifty miles an hour thing is just like okay, uh, this this is demonstrating very very particular that it is like it's like a super awesome machine. Um, so so there we go. Anyway, my friends, we are we are running out of time again. Okay, so Glenn Flank Glenn, Glenn says the USS Holland was the United States Navy's first modern commissioned submarine. Okay. Um but not the first submersible, it's just seventeen seventy five turtle. Um which okay, so first modern sub dates from nineteen hundred. So so yeah, so he's he's basically presumably taking ideas that were current at the time and then extrapolating into the future a bit, which is what what science fiction writers do you know the, the the parallel now of course is taking things like wormholes and hyperspace and things that are being discussed by physicists and then science fiction writers basically taking those and projecting those into the future aren't they um so yeah it's 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 the, it's the right thing to do yeah so you know props to jules verne so so next week uh which will be our fourth week now we are very slowly making our way through this story i'm not sure how how long do you guys <laughs> spend on this one because i think we've proved it's a good book I'm, I'm happy for us to say it's a good book i'm happy to do another week on it because i think it's really really good um i don't know how you know because there's a lot of adventures to go on this and do we do we cherry pick some good bits or do we just basically say guys read it because it's a good story um or do we want to skip to the end and find out what happens next week um because it's it's a good story i mean or we can just keep going through it i don't mind which what would you prefer to do um because it, it is a good it is a good book there's, there's some good stuff in it it's a good it's a good adventure um atova says first time chat hey you're going through your elite series on youtube and checking to see if you're streaming now um you are <laughs> i am yes i am good to see you atova um here's a sub to say thanks for the retro content oh no problem at all yes so lots of lots of retro content on there for you to enjoy um can we have something newer after this um yes Cherry pick. There's just so much listing of aquatic life. Okay, so I think cherry picking is quite a good idea. Um, so cover the underwater diving section, though. Okay, could we skip on a bit? Okay, we will. Uh, this rate will finish in June. <laughs> okay, well we'll skip on through the best bits. Um, nominate to me um, the, the best bits. I mean, I, I know there's the bit with the um, um, the squid, and there's the um, um, there's a uh, um, maelstrom and various other bits and there's the underwater bit and there's the bit with the pearl and various other bits and pieces um and and there's bits that go wrong as well they have they have some problems but though so there's some dramatic bits in there which are good storytelling so uh obviously the squid fight yes so um so yeah okay so we'll go through okay well, we'll crack on from there next week i do want to do a little bit we'll do a little bit next week about the actual discussion we won't spend too much time on here but there's some of the just construction stuff in there is actually quite interesting so we'll do a bit of that next week as well uh, and the page which has on it the word the end <laughs> says Windermute. Uh, 
<laughs> and something more modern. OK, so we'll have to nominate it. Now, the problem with something more modern is we may actually have to spend some money uh, unless I've already got a copy of said book um, in, in my, my extensive Nautilus like library. We'll have to see how it goes. But if you want to think about what we do after Jules Verne, something more modern, I think it's not necessarily a bad idea. We've, sort of, we've done some of the past masters of science fiction. Let's let's try something else and see what we think. Um, now, I don't know, actually, for something something that it is in copyright, am I allowed to put it on the screen? <laughs> or do I just have to hold the book up and read it to you? Because <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I can download an EPUB version of the thing and stick it on a Kindle emulator on the screen. But I mean, is that is that slightly dodge? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to investigate that. Anyway, my friends, that's a, that's a topic for another day. Um, look after yourselves. Have a fantastic week ahead. Be good. Um, Amazon do a lot of Kindle books for 99p, yes, there we go. Asimov and Hugo and places like that, yes, we could do some of those. Um, <laughs> you won't tell anyone. <laughs> this goes to trial, I want separate lawyers. Um, uh, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out. Asimov might, is, is not a bad, we could do Asimov's first foundation book, that's that's a bit of a classic, isn't it? Uh, or some, um, um, you know, Ringworld, uh, Larry Niven, things like that. So anyway, let's we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll figure some stuff out. Right. Be good, my friends. Have a fantastic weekend. Right on. As always, take care and I'll see you soon.